The state of Virginia has a deep and complex history. From its start as one of the 13 colonies to its attempted secession in the Civil War. And I doubt anyone would say that we don't have our fair share of history and battles. So in learning about our history, and of course, getting ready to enjoy Oklahoma, I'm going to share with you some excerpts from Waters of the Potomac by Paul Metcalf about the beauty of Virginia and Maryland from early settlement to the Civil War. Enjoy. Antietam, the Maryland Campaign, September 3rd to the 21st, 1862, by General Robert E. Lee, commanding the Army of Northern Virginia, not to permit the season of active operations to pass without endeavoring to inflict injury upon the enemy. The best course appeared to be the transfer of of the army into Maryland, the troops poorly provided with clothing and thousands of them destitute of shoes. It was yet believed to be strong enough to detain the enemy upon the northern frontier until the, re the approach of winter. On the 3rd of September, we marched with three days' rations and by Vocted at Drainsville. The order was given on the following day for Jackson to cross the Potomac. We marched through Leesburg, the men splashed through the water, and we were all struck with the beautiful scenery of this part of the country. As we climbed the hills, long stretches of the valley extended as far as the eye could reach in the direction of the Potomac. The diary of Bartlett Yancey Malone. Bartlett Y. Malone was born and raised in North Carolina, Casper in the year of our Lord, 1838, and was graduated in the cornfield in the tobacco patch, and enlisted in the war June 18, 1861. May your days be days of pleasure, and may your nights be nights of rest. That's all I ask. Forget me not. Remember me when I'm gone. Dear friend, remember me, Dietrich's Lord, I went to love, we alas, forgot too often. It's never been this cold before. It's winter of 1912, and a severe cold wave has struck here in Loudoun. I can't leave. I won't be able to get to Main Street safely. But the body's still here. I can't put the body outside. What do I do? It's too cold. I need to heat up the furnace. I only have a few wood logs left. Do I use it to heat up this old house, or do I save it for an emergency? As I'm starting my small fire, I begin to panic. What happens when the police knock on my door? They will most certainly suspect me. The, the murder weapon. What was it? Oh, a candle. On my table is a bloody candle. Evidence. That's what it was, and I need to destroy it. I need to burn it. I scramble for a match or a stick, and I find one on the frozen floor. My hands are shaking too much. I light the candle, and I sit. It smells like burning blood. It's melting. The candle is slowly disappearing. I'm happy. Another gust of freezing wind causes me to lose my focus. I wait patiently for the candle to die out, and I need a meal. Everything in the icebox is frozen. I needed to be more prepared for this winter, but I can't afford much else. In my cabinets above the furnace, I see dozens of jars. I'd meant to can with food. I didn't have the time to jar and preserve any food this winter. I had been too caught up with candle making and preparing for the cold. The storm has almost passed completely. I hear a knock at the door. They request to speak to Eustatius M. Weatherwax. That's me. I'm Eustatius M. Weatherwax. I let them in and ask what they need. They need to know where the body is. But I do not know. I had been trapped in my house during the winter of 1912. They look through my house and see nothing. However, my preserved food catches their eyes. They don't suspect anything. I insist that they take a few candles that I have made and ask if they want a few of my special jars of food. They agree, and soon they are gone. In early February of 1900s, Round Hill had a town meeting. It, at the time, consisted of ten streets that were lit by coal lamps. 
And that first council meeting was decided by the first mayor of Round Hill. Round Hill didn't start mentioning a fire service until 1903. It was proposed that two ladders be purchased, one 16 and one 32 foot. These ladders would be constructed by a local blacksmith named J.K. Reynolds. Neighbors would help neighbors by responding to the clanging of a large iron bell housed in the shed next to Old Charles Ford Grocery Store. 1915, the town council appointed the first and second fire chief, who were instructed to organize the volunteer fire company as we know it today. Council authorized a purchase of a hand-pulled fire hose cart or wagon with several lengths of hoses, and the following year it was reported that a purchase of a telephone pole was needed to hang the iron fire bell. Whenever fire bells clanged, concerned citizens would answer the call using that newly purchased fire hose cart and lengths of hoses connected to fire hydrants within the town. In 1925, the first firehouse was constructed between the Ford store and the, build and the bank building on Main Street. Howdy y'all, you're about to hear two stories of two teenage girls who may have lived in Ladin County, Virginia in the 1900s. We hope you enjoy. Here's our first story. Howdy y'all, I'm a 13 year old girl and I currently live in Loudoun County and I have lived here for about 10 months. I was born in Texas, but when I turned five months old, me and my family moved to Montana. Since then, we keep moving because it's too expensive to be a homeowner. So we just keep renting house out until my parents can find stable jobs. My daily chores include washing dishes, making dinner, walking our dog, and getting groceries. I also go to a local school that consists of only 10 kids other than myself. I've been studying recently on what degrees I need to get to become a teacher, since that is the only job us women can get. It has been nice here in Loudoun, but recently we've heard talk of a big rampage of people head towards Oklahoma. Since my father heard the rumors, he has wanted to move out there and settle on new land. The week following these rumors, we packed our Ford Model T and headed out west. We arrived two days later to the grand state of Oklahoma, where there was a hustle and bustle every corner you turned, and with crops growing every which way. I have made so many friends. I met two young girls while I was in a grocery store and was looking for some rations for that night's dinner. I bumped into a seven-year-old girl and followed behind her was a girl who was only 10 years older than me. We talked and talked. After we realized that we were all getting the same groceries for dinner, we swapped recipes and they even talked about this huge box social that was going to take place. I will be accompanying them tonight. Hi y'all, you may have seen me around these here parts in Oklahoma, but did you know that I'm actually not from Oklahoma? That's right, I was born and raised in Loudoun County, Virginia. We grew crops, mainly corn, and made ourselves a living in that. I even went to the schoolhouse for one full year with my brand new shoes that Pa was able to afford from the crops. But in the summer, our crops failed and we went into major debt. We tried to pull ourselves out from that, but it was no use. So Pa went to searching and reading the paper for opportunities to pull ourselves out from the funk we were in. Eventually, Pa talked to our neighbor, whose brother moved to a brand new place called Oklahoma. Apparently, everybody and their mama was moving to Oklahoma for the deserted lands and wide open sky. This is a great way for us to grow our crops again. So we packed up everything in our horse-drawn wagon and made the long trek to Oklahoma. Once we finally made it, we settled in just fine to grow our crops and became friendly with the townsfolk. <laughs> Despite making great friends with these girls around my age, I feel like I'm still looked down upon because of my pa's occupation. But with my friends and the grassy green prairie, I know I'll be just fine. You hear the birds chirping while you're walking through town, with insects to back them up. The horses clomping beside you, scraping the dirt off their hooves on the gravel road, with the smell of manure wandering through the air aimlessly, which you can taste when you breathe. Then you look up and notice a passionate speaker talking about the injustices that African Americans face. At first, you don't mind. You think that is a political candidate looking for some exposure. Then you look at the crowd and realize that it's more than that. The next second, you realize that this person is Frederick Douglass, a free slave from the North advocating for justice for African Americans and women's rights, who also created the North Star newspaper, 
But before we delve into more about the climate, we need to know more about the political environment of Loudoun County. For example, 58% of the electorate in Leesburg voted against prohibition, yet 54% of Loudoun County residents voted for prohibition. So the county currently has a political divide of some sort. Though, let's continue the scene. After you realize that this is Frederick Douglass, you join the crowd and see that there isn't a person yelling at Frederick Douglass that he's wrong or yelling trying to disrupt people, but listening to him. This is unheard of today because of everyone yelling at each other for thinking differently than each other, yet back in the 1880s, people were open to listening to the other side, which is something that we as a society should learn. Hello, my name is Caitlin Basor, and I'm a groom at Morven Park. For those of you who don't know, Morven Park is the governor's estate. It's a beautiful landscape with green hills and beautiful sunsets. There are thousands of dark green trees and silky flowers that smell like perfume. It really is a paradise here. The year is 1920 and I'm 15 years old. My day usually starts with riding to Morven Park from my farm. I then start catching the horses from the field and putting them in their stalls. I also groom the horses and tack them up for their riders. I spend the rest of my time cleaning up and sweeping the barn. On my days off, I work with my family and help my mom cook. My brothers think horses are weird and lazy, despite my efforts to convince them otherwise. Horses aren't as big of a thing as they used to be. Now the excitement is with those new buggies and automobiles. Some might consider this an old-fashioned job, but I love working with horses. Often, Governor Westmoreland Davis comes down and visits the barn to ride and check on his horses. Davis and his wife also do fox hunting and horse racing quite often. I have the honor of tacking up and taking care of their horses. Normal life isn't too bad for me. I'm lucky. Both of my parents love horses and taught me how to ride and take care of horses. Lovisville has always been a sleepy little town. If you'd walk down Main Street, you could really smell the flowers and beautiful trees that overhang the main road and be sorely interrupted by the horses walking by and the blacksmith pounding away at whatever metal he was working on. You'd really feel the warmth coming out of his shop and the, you'd hear the kids playing into the fields out to the left of you. And as you're walking, you'd feel the brick underneath your feet shift and whittle down a little bit. And as you're Walking down the street, you'd hear the screams of joy that come out of the hotel every once in a while. For what reason, you'd only hope to understand. You'd turn on into your house and you'd feel the sturdy door and walk on in. You'd hear the creak of the floorboards underneath your boots. And you'd just smell the warmth of your house and you'd... Your family would come up to greet you, and you'd truly feel like this is your home. It feels cr- truly a great place. So every family mostly would have something called a root cellar. A root cellar is something underground, um, which would really help because the ground most of the time is very cold with all the snow and everything that happens here in Virginia. It would act almost as a refrigerator. Um, you could preserve meats, fruits, and vegetables, again, like a refrigerator, And there was a lot of, like, early preservation, so packing things in salt, canning even, just really making sure that everything can stay as fresh as long as possible. Because, again, it was kind of hard trying to, you know, make meals for everyone. It's not as easy as it is today. Normally, cost of food was very, very cheap, always, like, five, ten cents for certain kinds of salads and just cuts of meat. Um, A normal breakfast would have been toast or porridge with a cup of tea. Lunch would have been like sandwich type of things. So like sliced ham, biscuits, normally with a fruit and a vegetable. And kids would come home halfway through the school day to eat their lunch and then would go back to school. And for dinners, um, families would have on Sunday nights, they would have a big family dinner where everyone would sit down together and have a warm meal. That could have been some nice warm chicken with a baked sweet potato and green corn, cauliflower, lots of different nice things to eat all as a family. Um, And for some desserts, they would have had cake or tea. Halfway through the day when the kids would come home and have their lunch, most of the time the wives would have a meal packed for their husbands that were at work, like a lunch, and the kids would drop that off for them. If you live in Percival or Round Hill, you probably have heard of Franklin Park, 
and some of our cast members have even performed in their arts center. But have you ever wondered what this beautiful park was before it was Willow Park? In fact, in the 1900s, it, and some of the neighborhoods surrounding it, was actually the Franklin Farm. Or even before that, Hillendale Farm. A dairy farm that was rumored to deliver milk to the White House. And I'm going to take you on a bit of a sensory tour of this farm. First, sound. If you listen, you could hear the cows mooing, the creaking of the wood of the dairy barn, the children running and roughhousing in the pastures, and maybe even the horn of a train that just pulled into the new Percival station along the WNOD railroad. Next, we'll move on to smell. Smell the fresh clover and honeysuckle of the fields and forests surrounding you. You can smell the cow manure that cuts through the sweet smells of the field. Let's step out of that unsavory moment. Yuck. Moving on, last you can smell the scent of freshly cut wood used in the construction of the barn. Now onto sight. You look upon the rolling hills and pastures not unlike the ones you can see around you now. And you see the black and white spots and lumps of the dairy cows grazing in the pastures. The different shades of grass forming the, a checkerboard pattern along the rolling landscape, broken up by little clumps of trees. The grand dairy barn filling the, up the space to your back. Last, touch. You feel the gentle touch of the tall grass as it taps your legs as the breeze sweeps across the pasture, as well as the slight heat on the, of the sun on the nape of your neck as it begins its descent to the other side of the hills. They arrived one morning. They cleared the trees that had sprung from me. They wiped the canvas I nurtured from the roots. They lay me open and bare. They pushed and pulled sheets made of my trees into a box. A barn, they said. Their dark-soled boots flattened the grass as they paced back and forth. They do bring new life, though. Darling little puffs of feathers peep. Balls of fur yip and growl at the wind. And two springs later... A baby's shriek splits the dawn air. I cradle the toddler as she grows. She gives me hope. A piece of life they've created instead of destroyed. She will not be destroyed. Tumbles don't hurt as much when she's with me. Her brother joins her a few years later. She gathers eggs from the dark birds, no longer puffs of feathers. She cares for the other creatures as well, milking and brushing and raising. Her friends come often. They skip and giggle. I hold them as well for her. The day the boy comes knocking was not a good one. She hums all the next day. He comes more frequently after that. He'll, he will take care of her, but I have watched her grow. They form the union in June. They inherit a scorched and empty farm. I ache with burns and scars. They hold a gathering. A new box is made. They build their home again. They bring new life. After a few years, in the deepest morning of the winter, a baby shriek splits the air. What it means to be a boy. I sit and ponder every day, for I do not know. When I was younger, I would run and play. Now I hoe the ground away. I'm done with school and I'm done with work, but I miss the learning. What it means to be a boy. Am I even still that? Daddy and me are the same. We work all day, every day. Am I still a boy? Is this what it means to be a man? In my room, my light flickers on and off. It's still new. I stare at it in wonder. A man put that in. A man. Is that what it means to be a man? I want to be a man. Not the man daddy wants. I like the school. I miss going to it. I could see the train. The nice big train. It was made the same time I was born. It changed everything. Even the town. That's what it means to be a man, to change. Daddy doesn't like the change. Does that make daddy not a man? I want to change. I want the help of trains. I want the help of electricity. I want to be a man. What it means to be a man. I sit and wonder now what it means to be a man. Round Hill truly came to be in the early 1900s. It zoomed foreign blacksmiths, wheelwright shops, and stables. It was soon an inhabited small town. Its first crisis hit, though, in June 1900, when a woman by the name of Mary Pines came down with a case of smallpox. But, with the help of a quarantining 
and a man named Charles Lloyd being paid a dollar a day to stand guard of her. The town soon recovered. Nevertheless, the town thrived. Streets being built in 1901 with names, Main Street being a host of stables, a train station, and mail carriers, the town boasting with the smell of freshly cut wood for new settlements. Back in the late 1800s, Woodgrove was the leading town, which was two miles north of Round Hill, soon being surpassed by Leesburg. From Philadelphia to Loudoun, the dogged lot did go. Who would dare settle without a major road or a river in sight? Fine soil and land racks, friends all one did go. Janney's mill seated blacksmiths, farmers, and mills, all for one and one for all. Worship and till did go. The Quaker life drew one and all. Scottish, Irish, and Germans. Waterford, Leesburg grew, but large farms brought slavery too. The Quakers of Waterford then flew into despair. Life and growth was stagnant as rails and canals bypassed all. Waning faith and materialism in the community failed did go. Civil war pitted all against our Quaker faith. Harsh treatment to us all. Yes, still the Quaker faith did toll freeing people of color did go. Years ago, there were trees everywhere. All the places to hide. But now, everywhere I look, I only see land and sky. Father had cut them down to make room for plants. That's all our family focuses on. While he and the rest of the men in our house work on the farm, I stay inside with my mother making butter and goods to sell in town. We grow and tend to all of it in the spring and winter summer. My favorite season though is fall. That's when we get to harvest everything to have a great feast. What we don't need for ourselves we send to the market. I miss when I was younger and could play in the woods with my brothers. We'd hide in the trees and mess around until inevitably one of our parents found me and told me to go inside. Now I spend my school days wishing to go out. I must learn how to cook, clean, and sew. Well, they're not a horrible task. I'd much rather spend time in the trees. Today is the day. It's today! July's hard, but I don't care because my mama said I do not have to wear stockings under my dress. Uncle Elliot packed the picnic in the wagon. It was going to be a long, hot ride to Lincoln from Lovettsville. Grown-ups said I had to hold on to my little brother's hand so he would not fall out of the wagon. Mama always talked about the time when her father took her to see Mr. Frederick Douglass give a speech in a field in Lincoln. We were going there today. She talked about how it was dangerous because the Confederate cavalry was known to roam about. She was there. She was actually there to see such an important man as Mr. Douglas. All she could see, though, was the backs of people at first. My mama had to pull and pull on my grandpa's trousers so he would lift her up so she could see. I closed my eyes in the wagon and imagined Mr. Douglas talking to the crowd as still and calm as could be, even though the Confederate cavalry might be stalking about. I could hear the pebbles underneath the wagon's wheels. Sounded like rhythm and song, and it made me feel even more excited to get there. I sat there with my eyes closed and listened to the rhythm the whole way there. Then... We arrived in Lincoln, and we walked behind the Quaker meeting house for what seemed to be hours on end. Did I mention it was hot? Did I mention I had to hold my little brother's hand and pull and pull as we walked? Finally, we got to an open field. My mama looked around as if she was not so sure it was the right place. Then she saw the rocks. She pointed and said, there's where he stood. I could barely hear him, but then my daddy lifted me up on his shoulders. I saw he had big hair and a beard and fancy clothes. My uncle spread out the picnic blanket and my mama put on the food. I walked towards the rocks and closed my eyes. I walked hoping I would not trip for my self-imposed blindness. And the bird calls became louder and louder. I could almost hear 
I could imagine Mr. Douglas's deep voice. I felt if I could just capture the words from the rocks of the most famous abolitionist, maybe I could bring a piece of freedom home with me back to the farm in Lovettsville. Gather round, gather close, and let me tell you the story of Tom Wisner, the voice of the Chesapeake. Born in 1930, Tom Wisner dedicated his life to the land on which he was born and where his ancestors lie, the Chesapeake Basin. He told its stories through poetry and song and spoke for the land when it had no tongue of its own. In this era came a need for unity within our people and our land. I loved being a boy growing up in America, watching fields of lightning bugs, forehead resting on my arm against a telephone pole. I loved being a boy in America, sitting on a curb on Constitution Avenue, waving at my dad marching down the middle. I saw Eisenhower come home to America down that avenue. They were the most precious moments of my boyhood, those times we went out together, fishing in the Potomac River or walking through the woods and enjoying the squirrels and birds. He loved taking the steamboat out of D.C. down Potomac River to Mount Vernon Colonial Beach in Marshall Hall. I loved to go with him. It was near this old town by that old muddy river that I began to merge with the watery world. Still today, I can look down and see the Potomac water swirling from the motion of the paddle wheel. Catching catfish with my dad, we'd stand back on the grass or sometimes out on the heavy granite wall, high above the ooze along her side. Even then I loved the river near where the Shenandoah came in, bright and clear and fast, rich with trout and black leeches, or in her lower reach past Nanjamoy, where she takes the tide up into her long, flat curves and nurtures the striper and the crab. The lives of my immediate family have been lived in relationship with the three major rivers of the 64,000 square mile drainage basin of the Chesapeake. My mom was raised on a Virginia farm and grist mill on James River. Near my mom's home, Jefferson's vision of our democracy was forged in the rich, fertile, rolling Piedmont of Virginia. My mother's people are over eight generations here. We are Celtic Native Americans. I love my native bearing. I am also of the elemental people who became railroad engineers and brakemen, soldiers and sailors. Since early childhood, I have been drawn to sit with the elders and listen to their stories. My great teachers have been grizzled old watermen and women, dusty farmers, tobacco auctioneers, sail makers, and a fine old blacksmith and farmer on the James River who was my grandfather. My origins in the folk world started with listening to old timers sitting around in a circle in my uncle Luther's James River country store. My life has been about trying to bring the life of the river into the remembered ambiance of the community of that store. I'm coming home, I've done my time. Now I've got to know what is and isn't mine. If you received my letter telling you I'd soon be free, then you'll know just what to do if you still want me. If you still want me Just tie a yellow ribbon round the old oak tree It's been three long years Do you still want me? If I don't see a ribbon round the old oak tree I'll stay on the bus, forget about us And put the blame on me if I don't see a ribbon round the old oak tree. Bus driver, please, please look for me. Cause I couldn't bear to see what I might see. I'm really still in prison and my love, she holds the key. A simple yellow ribbon's what I need to set me free. And I wrote and told her, please. Whoa, put a yellow ribbon round the old oak tree. It's been three long years. Do you still want me? If I don't see a ribbon round the old oak tree, I'll stay on the bus. Forget about us and put the blame on me If I don't see a ribbon round the old oak tree
Now the whole damn bus is cheering and I can't believe what I see A hundred yellow ribbons round the old oak tree I'm coming home, I'm coming home